Welcome everybody to Glugnet. This month we are pleased to be back in person again. Uh, so we are here at the Lansing Makerspace and online as well. Thank you everyone who's joining us. Uh, tonight we are pleased to welcome Matt Groves who's going to be speaking to us about SQL++ for big data. A couple housekeeping items before we get started. If you could please remain muted if you're not asking a question or answering a question. That way we can all hear the presentation. That'd be great. Um, at the end of tonight's presentation, there will be a survey link sent out to give Matt feedback on his presentation. It's all anonymous, so good, bad, somewhere in between. We want to hear all the feedbacks. Please fill it out. Next month, we're back to uh, virtual again. Um, we are still in communications with TechSmith about trying to get their space. Um, the, if you know of an alternate space as well, we'd be happy to hear about that. The issue with TechSmith is they can't sponsor us unless they have a commitment from uh, multiple employees to be there with us during our meetings to uh, babysit us. Um, and it makes sense, right? It's a brand new building. There needs to be someone there. Uh, but we don't have that commitment yet, so until we do. Yeah. Fair enough. Sounds good. All right. Well, without further ado, take it away, Matt. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And hello, everybody. And uh, thank you for having me here. And hello to everybody online watching it live or watching it later. I'm glad you're here as well. We're going to talk about uh, SQL for big data today. And uh, let's just start by I've already talked to this crowd in here, and they're pretty uh, friendly to SQL. But just a quick review that you know SQL is a very popular language. It's this is the Stack Overflow survey uh, results from 2023, and SQL is actually kind of kind of down a little bit, but it's still one of the top languages in the world. Uh, it's the number one language in the world for dealing with data. So it is definitely one of those lingua franca type of categories: you know, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and SQL. You know, those are the top languages, and Python's up there too. Uh, so then I guess the question is, if SQL is so popular, what's all this stuff about NoSQL, right? I'm from Couchbase. We're a NoSQL company. So uh, why would anyone want to use NoSQL? So we'll talk about that a little bit today. I'm going to cover uh, a brief introduction in comparison of SQL and relational uh, data. And then I'm going to talk about what NoSQL means. Um, and, and you know why people are using it, what are the benefits of it. And, and one of the things I'm going to tackle today is one of the criticisms of NoSQL is that it's difficult to do any sort of reporting and analytics from NoSQL. So how is Couchbase in the NoSQL world addressing that? I've got a short demo uh, to show some SQL++ in action, and then I've got some resources to help you get started and uh, just some up there towards the end. Uh, I'm Matthew Groves. If you've got Couchbase questions, happy to talk with you uh, during or after. Um, uh, or any time in the future if you're watching this uh, video. Um, I also am a uh, author of some books and videos. I'm doing some live streaming right now of um, building a project in ASP.NET we're talking about. ASP.NET, um, pretty cool project. I think it's pretty cool. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out on Twitch there. Um, I'm on Twitter or X as it's called these days. I'm still going to call it Twitter because I've just been calling it that for 15 years or whatever. So. I'll get used to it eventually. I'm also, uh, since this is a .NET group, I'll bring this up. I am the creator of the C Sharp Advent. If you're not familiar with that, it's an event in December where every day from the 1st to the 25th, we unlock, unwrap uh, two pieces of C Sharp content that are contributed by people like you who are creating videos or blog posts or code or whatever and sharing that with the community. Uh, so it's a great event. Check it out. The science will open up very soon. i got to get those open probably um, probably towards the end of this month. But csadvent.christmas, check that out. Yes, that's a real URL. You can go check that out there. All right, so enough of that intro. SQL++ for big data. Let's get into it. Let's start with a little bit of a brief history of uh, data and, and databases, if, you don't, if you'll indulge me. So this is a period I like to call BR, before relational. And this is, you know, there were databases around before Oracle, before Postgres, and these were not relational. They had, uh, they were just, you know, what people were just creating to put data in. They were, they were rare, barely even like a piece of separate software. 
So it's got pretty poor ad hoc query capability. You had to basically understand machine code to query the data. Relationships were, again, just kind of baked into the program itself, not the data or anything. And so you have low level languages and tooling. So that's what the situation was like in the database world. Uh, then you have this period I call BS or before SQL. Uh, and so this is this man up here, EF Cod. He invented the relational model in 1970, uh, around that period of time, and did a lot of great theoretical work and research. Um, and uh, he actually did not invent SQL. He invented the relational database, but uh, he actually designed a language for it called Alpha, which you know, has some similarities to SQL, but it never really got implemented. It was influential, but didn't really get implemented. But one quote I want to point out from his original paper is right there on the screen there is that, you know, he's talking about the benefits of relational, but he also talks about places where relational may not be, you know, may have some trade-offs. Um, so it was interesting that he's had the forethought to kind of um, perceive that SQL or relational data, I should say, is not always the right answer. And then this period called AS or after SQL. So uh, SQL as a language was created by Don Chamberlain, uh, shown here, and Raymond Boyce. You may have heard those names before, like Boyce Cod Normal Form. Uh, this was designed to be English friendly, kind of like a COBOL for databases. And uh, nowadays we kind of say SQL and relational as kind of synonyms, but they really are two separate things. You know, relational is a way to store data, and, uh, uh, and um, SQL is a way to query that data. So they really are separate, even though we kind of group them together as one thing. Uh, so EF Cod pointed out in his paper some of the trade-offs to think about. And then, of course, uh, SQL, is, is, uh, SQL and relational have dominated uh, since the 70s. And uh, people, of course, uh, especially when the web comes along, start to criticize and, and say, well, here's some of the things we are uh, giving up when we use relational and SQL. Um, so these are often times the uh, trade-offs or criticisms of relational databases. So I'll go through a couple of these. The first one is what's called impedance mismatch. Uh, so the way impedance mismatch, it's a fancy term for basically means that you're storing data differently than you're using data. All right, so on the left here, we had uh, five pieces of data stored in two tables, and that actually makes up a total of two shopping carts. But in our application, we might use a class like this, shopping cart class, that has a list of items in it. So it's a single shopping cart item. So that's that's a, that's the mismatch there. That's They're not exactly the same form of data. So what we how we deal with that is uh, we use tools like ORMs, Entity Framework, and Hibernate, and so on, to try to handle that mismatch. And they do an OK job. Maybe the 80-20 rule applies there. That last 20 can be a real pain. The second thing, and this is kind of where NoSQL really started from, is scaling. So when it comes to scaling, the easiest way to scale a traditional relational database is vertical scaling. So you take one a database server and you just put it on a bigger machine, more memory, more disk, uh, and so on. Um, with uh, a NoSQL database, the idea is horizontal scaling. So you keep adding additional machines to a cluster instead of... Uh, having one machine that is just bigger and bigger. Because that vertical scaling is, you know, that's the easiest way to do it, but that can get very expensive. And it can also eventually hit a ceiling, as we talked about earlier. Uh, your databases are crashing because they have trillions of records in them. Right? So horizontal scaling uh, can be a lot cheaper. It can scale bigger, but it's more difficult to do with relational style data. And this is all about uh, concurrency. You know, this is a famous uh, paper here called The Free Lunch is Over that uh, kind of talks about Moore's Law as kind of uh, plateauing. And that leads us to, if we want to keep advancing the amount of uh, processing we can do, we have to turn to concurrency. You know, multiple machines, clusters of machines, distributed systems, and distributed databases. The third one I want to cover today is inflexibility. And this is one that's, I think, very appealing to developers, uh, especially because of the rise of agile methodologies and being able to respond to change over following a plan. So one example of uh, a change in relational is schema changes. So this is a kind of a very simple schema here, but imagine I have credit card information in the same row as a uh, customer's name and customer customer ID or whatever in that customer table, all right? 
kind of a rookie mistake in database design, right? But uh, if I want to change that, I then have to create another table to move that data from customer into billing, and to remove those columns, put in a foreign key constraint, and make all those changes to the schema. And you know that seems simple enough, but uh, with a large enough database, you know, changing a schema like that can have a huge impact. It can result in downtime, a locked database, and you know, this is a really simple four or five table schema. When we get into more and more tables, it gets more expensive, more risky to make those kind of changes. So we're not able to respond to those changing requirements uh, as easily. So uh, criticism disclaimer though, especially because I'm in a room full of relational, people using relational databases that are generally happy with them. I'm not here to convince you the relational is dead. You know, far from it, that's, that's kind of a ridiculous thing to say. Um, relational is fine. Uh, if you're working with relatively small sets of data, right, for, for some definition of small. If you're working with data that doesn't change structures very much, for, again, for some definition of how often that means. If you're not feeling any performance problems or scaling issues right now, then relational is totally fine. But, you know, if you're not experiencing these problems now, you may in the future. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, you know, th this is a, another tool you can use to help you solve problems. So in that case, what if it's not fine? What if we are having at least one of those problems? You know, what are some ways to deal with it? And NoSQL databases can really help in this situation. So what is NoSQL? NoSQL is basically, uh, there's lots of different approaches to it, but the idea with you know, distributed NoSQL is that data is now in isolated pieces. So for instance, a JSON database has documents. So it's individual JSON objects stored as a document. And those are not tied to other pieces of data, like in a relational database. So those documents can live anywhere in the cluster. And uh, they can be split between those different nodes. And that process is often called sharding. So that's why I always think of Fortress of Solitude when I think of sharding for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so, But they aren't tightly coupled to each other or to a table anymore. So they can be moved around and live anywhere on a cluster of machines. So that's one of the ways that they can help improve scaling. So I have some examples here. This is a very simple example of a piece of data in a NoSQL database. This is a JSON document. This is flat data. You can imagine this in a, a row in a table, right? So this is a very simple example. Notice the document key. Document database is, is kind of a more advanced version of a key value store. So think of a dictionary, like in .NET, for instance. Very similar to that. The value is JSON and the key is some string. Now this may look different from database to database. There may some of them may have the the document key inside the JSON. In this case, it's metadata about the JSON, but it's the same uh, basic principle. This is a more complex example. So in this case, this is a airline route between two different airports. The schedule element there uh, is an array of JSON objects. So in a relational database, that would be at least one separate table with foreign keys. Uh, but in this case, it's all domestic data. So there's no uh, mismatch here. There's no uh, joining required. This is easier to scale because I can move this one piece of data on any of the machines in my cluster. Um, and there's no schema to follow as well. So I could add fields to just this one document if I want to, without having to lock every document in the database to make that adjustment. So I could add uh, you know, whatever, a, a weather field to this particular document, just 55758, and not any other ones, if I wanted to, if that was necessary. Um, so in this case, the scheduling is, schedule is embedded as an array, but you don't always have to do that. So notice the airline field up here, this airline 5209. So th in this case, I've not embedded the, uh, the airline information into this document uh, because, you know, uh, there might be reasons I want to do that, but uh, if the airline changes, then I don't have to go back and update all the routes to make that change. So uh, it still might make sense to have some fields. This is kind of like a foreign key where I'm pointing to another document to get the airline information. Okay, uh, so the basic set of operations in NoSQL, this is back in the old, old days of when NoSQL first started. This is why it was called NoSQL, because all these operations here don't involve any SQL. That's really where the buzzword came from. 
Uh, and that's kind of the usefulness of NoSQL buzzword ends right there because it doesn't really tell us anything else about the database. Uh, it's not a very useful technical term. So I like to use things like key value and document and graph. But anyway, this is kind of how it works. Every document has the key. If I know the key, I can say it will give me the data for that key, and now I have it. I can set by key, delete by key, and there's something called a map reduce I could use to process all this data if I wanted to uh, do some sort of grouping or querying. Uh, and there's other operational query languages that are available, again, depending on the technology you're using, depending on the type of database it is. So, for instance, uh, Mongo has a JavaScript-like kind of DSL query language. So you have to learn how to use that to query Mongo data. Couchbase actually ha uses SQL for operational data. So that's my favorite thing about Couchbase because I come from a SQL Server background and I know SQL is valuable and useful and I'd like to keep using that if I can. Uh, but then let's get into uh, NoSQL criticism. This is what I want to mainly focus on today is uh, there are other criticisms, of course. I've just numbered this one one, but uh, the this is a criticism as old as NoSQL itself, is that, uh, you know, uh, how do I report on it? So I might have large amounts of data in my cluster, and if I try to query that with anything, anything more than a, a really basic CRUD operation, I could really impact operations. I could really, uh, you know, put a lot of stress on that database and impact the end user. And, of course, as I mentioned, I might have to learn a new query language to do these things, even if... Those first two weren't a problem. I have to learn a brand new language from scratch to do that. So suppose your database is used for the back end of an e-commerce site, for instance. Okay. Everything's humming along nicely. Customers are adding items to their shopping cart. Everyone's happy. They're browsing the catalog. They're, they're doing all these things with well-known, well-indexed queries that are not ad hoc. They're going to be well-defined up front. Suddenly, I come along as a, a BI analyst or whatever, and I want to create a report. I have a really complicated query for that data or an ad hoc query, and I don't have proper indexing or sizing or tuning, and I just go ahead and run that query, I could impact customers. I could slow them down or cause timeouts or something like that, and now we're losing revenue. So that is a real issue with these some of these really big data NoSQL systems. So how do we deal with that? Uh, so I want to Focus mainly on analytics and reporting today with NoSQL. If you have other NoSQL questions, I'm happy to talk about them, but we're going to focus mainly on analytics today. So I want to define a couple terms first. One is operational versus operational analytics. I've kind of mentioned operational already. That's the front end of the e-commerce site, the queries that are running by a lot of concurrency, you know, hundreds, thousands of users potentially. Operational analytics is I want to do querying and dashboards and reporting on that data as close to real time as possible. I don't want to wait 24 hours to get a copy of that data or longer, a week or whatever. Uh, and I want to maybe even analyze the last hour of data potentially for reporting, trend analysis, whatever. And then, of course, the third option I'm not talking about is analytics, which is the extreme long run, and extreme amounts of history. That's your data science kind of operation or kind of uh, um, use cases there. So I'm calling it operational analytics, but these um, these uh, analyst companies here, they have their own names for it, because of course they do. So Gartner calls it HTAP, which is Hybrid Transaction Analytics Processing. Uh, 451 calls it HOPE, which is Hybrid Operational Analytical Processing. And Forrester calls it Translytical. But these are all three names for the same thing. We want faster big data insights, and we want them as close to operational data as possible. So I mentioned operational. Uh, so Domino's is a Couchbase customer. Uh, they have their website going, a mobile app, or anything where there's a lot of end users, right? That's your operational queries, your operational data. So a query to get uh, a list of nearby locations, uh, a query for all the menu items available, a query for a store owner to get a list of incoming orders, you know, things like that. Those are operational queries. They're going to run with high concurrency, lots and lots of users, and they're well-defined and should run very quickly versus a, a dashboard type thing. We're going to an answer enterprise-wide questions. Uh, so, for instance, Domino's uses uh, Couchbase for marketing to create personalized ad hoc campaigns with real-time operational data. So they want to figure out how can we get people to buy more pizza. So we analyze their buying patterns. We send them custom coupons tailored just for them, that sort of thing. 
We can also get sales figures, inventory, slice and dice by region, date range, zip code, whatever. And teams can pull right from a repository without having to submit a request to the database team because we're not talking about querying the operational data directly. Right? We don't want to impact that operational data. So that's kind of the key here is with operational workload, we have lots of concurrency. We've got well-defined queries that are indexed and optimized and understood. And we've got uh, generally simple queries, not, not always, but they can be simple queries, you know, CRUD operations or, uh, you know, those well understood, simple that we need for the website. And performance is vital. How long is a customer willing to wait until they ditch your site, right? You know, if it's more than a second, chances are they might bail out and go to some, one of your competitor sites. Versus operational analytics, which is going to be fewer queries, less concurrency. This is going to be BI analysts doing this work, right? It's going to be ad hoc. So could be different queries today, different queries an hour from now. Uh, could be very, very complex, right? Tons of joins, lots of data, um, multiple sources of data, very complex type of things. Low latency is always nice to have, but it's not the most important thing here. Because we're not impacting like web page load times directly. Right? We're, we're building reports for our own use or for marketing's use or something. So how are people doing this? How am I doing operational analytics? In my experience, I've seen three or four approaches. I want to cover some of those today. Maybe some of you are doing one of these already. So here's the first one. This is the very first one I saw in my career. The approach was, I don't know. We don't know. We don't have a plan for this. We don't want to think about it. We've got a bunch of access databases. Uh, we copy the operational data when we want to, you know, kind of when we feel like it. Or we just link directly to it and hope no one screws it up. <laughs> that's an approach I've actually seen before. I'm hoping that's not as common as it used to be, but it probably still happens. So that's bad, right? We know that's bad. What's another approach? Another approach is kind of the two database approach or multiple database approach or kind of a data warehouse approach. Uh, Martin Fowler calls this a reporting database. Um, so we're taking data from operational database, we're copying to the reporting database. Maybe we're copying it every 24 hours, every week, or, or some sort of uh, situation like that. Um, the, the thing about this diagram that always gets me is that little arrow in the middle there, because that is where the pain really is, right? Uh, creating that ETL or buying an ETL, maintaining the ETL or multiple ETLs, again, it could be an impedance mismatch right there in that arrow, if we're coming from, you know, semi-structured data or JSON data or a third party that changes their schema ever, ever they feel like it. Um, maybe the reporting database has a different schema, duplicated data in some cases. It's optimized for reporting queries, right? Uh, and of course, size and performance is another issue. So it probably has to be around the same size of operational database. If it's multiple operational databases, it's got to be even bigger than that to handle that kind of a, kind of a load. So that's the second approach, reporting database. That's, you know, that's better than approach one, but there's still some troubles there, especially that arrow in the middle. That's often even bigger because it's denormalized. Yeah, right. So if it's denormalized, it's going to be an even bigger footprint. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. The third approach. Has anyone here used Hadoop before? No one's used Hadoop. Okay. So Hadoop is kind of designed for massive scale, but not massive speed. It's analytics, it's not really operational analytics. I mean, people might try to do it that way, but uh, it's not really, it's too big of a hammer for that. So we have to think about Hadoop as it's just this one thing, but really there's a bunch of Hadoops. I think it's behind the SQL analytics. Hadoop is? Very, very well be. So it's like, that's one of those things that's built on top of Hadoop, right? And is it built on top of MapReduce, Yarn? Um, is it uh, something like uh, Pig? Doing the querying or Hive or Spark SQL, something like that. Um, Apache, say that again. Hadoop is, Hadoop is Apache. Yes, yes. I think I think most of these are Apache projects. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Solar is a search engine. Uh, Cassandra is a another NoSQL database. HBase is a similar one to Cassandra. And uh, Zookeeper, always fun when you got to bring in Zookeeper. Uh, so yeah, lots of pieces there. It's a really, really big hammer 
uh, and it might not be the best fit unless you're analyzing a huge, huge amount of data, uh, or you have, or you're in no particular rush to get answers to your questions. Uh, this is kind of designed for petabytes, petabytes plus of data. Um, this is the data lake, if you will, analyze the entire history of New York Times, for instance, that kind of data. The fourth approach, which I want to talk about today mainly, is SQL++. Uh, because you already know how to write SQL, right? it's designed to work with all kinds of structures of data, so no SQL or even relational style data. And you can often get away with very minimal or no ETL required to do this kind of analytics. Uh, this is a cover of a book, actually. And if you want, I can get you a link to this, give you a free PDF copy of it if you want to read it. But that name down there is John Chamberlain one of the inventors of SQL. So he's actually an advisor of Couchbase and he's helped us uh, with SQL++ and he's written this book uh, about you know, how SQL++ kind of advances SQL and uh, it's a really great book. Um, he's an academic, so it's definitely an academic style book, but uh, it's really, it's not that long of a read. So I definitely recommend checking it out. It's also available on Amazon in a print copy if you wanna get that. So let's talk about SQL in general, just a quick review. Hopefully, everyone, is everyone here writing SQL? Anyone not know SQL? Might be somebody watching this video that might not know, which by the way, I should be checking the chat for any sort of questions or comments. Hopefully Sam would stop me if he saw something. Okay, nothing yet. So here's SQL. I have a table, I have a SQL query, and pretty simple stuff there. We've seen this before. Um, you know, I can, I can query uh, with a predicate, and uh, this will return what? This will return one row, row number one there. Okay. Um, as Don Chamberlain has said once, JSON kind of looks like tables if you squint hard enough. So in this case here, we've got a, a, a collection of JSON data. And if you kind of squint, it looks a bit like a table. And so then we could say, well, what if we just applied SQL to JSON data? It's the same exact query here. Uh, if, this, if this worked, what would you expect it to return? Again, the same thing, just that first piece of data there, uh, Matt Groves, uh, where because uh, that's the only one that has baz equal to flux. All right. Uh, so there's a whole academic paper about this. If you Again, if you want to read the very dry uh, bedtime reading um, from the UC uh, San Diego. And they went through and they uh, created this SQL++ query language project. And Couchbase was actually the first commercial implementation of it. So I can give you a link to that paper if you want to read all of that. But SQL++ is backwards compatible with SQL. So the language itself, the underlying data is still different, right? But remember, it was designed kind of after relational. So it's a language we can apply to other types of data. And it's collections of JSON documents. But the plus plus there is the superpowers, right? So SQL is made for the flat relational data. SQL++ takes it a step further to deal with structured and semi-structured data and therefore superpowers, the plus plus part. So let's go through a few of them. I'm not gonna cover them all because it's a lot, but just a few examples. And these are ones that people often ask me about. Let's say, well, what about this? What about this? How would I do this with JSON? So nested objects, if we have rich data like this, this is a simple example, but we have an object that contains an object that contains an object and so on. How do I uh, deal with that in SQL++? So for instance, how do I uh, select uh, the city from each of these JSON documents? Well, I think it's pretty intuitive. Say address.city. It's a nested object. I can just use a dot notation to get that. So dotted syntax. Simple enough. Arrays, what about those? Now I have an array of strings in this case. It could be an array of objects or whatever, but an array of strings. How do I get um, the uh, second favorite food from each of these people here? Probably just use square brackets, right? Uh, select favorite foods one. This is going to return cheesecake and Lucky Charms. Okay, makes sense. All right, what about um, this situation? If I wanted to, if I had favorite foods as a separate table in relational world, right? I often want to join that, uh, and that would that would be a join between two tables. So I'd get Matt Pizza, Matt Cheesecake, Matt Donuts in this situation. In this case, it's not a separate piece of data, but I still might want to do that kind of operation, that kind of join. In this situation, that's called an unnest. 
Uh, so I'm going to unnest the favorite foods array into uh, alias of food. So I can select food and name, and then I get, as a result, pizza mat, cheesecake mat, donuts mat. So this is a type of intra-document join. It's called unnest. All right, quantification. I mentioned array syntax before, but I had to know the exact index of that item, right? I had to say, oh, I wanted the second one. What if I just wanted to ask, who are the users who have pizza as a favorite food? All right, well, how would I uh, navigate that? This is a little more complex, some new syntax for this. Uh, there is a uh, quantification. This is kind of like a lambda function there, where I have where any in satisfies end. So if any thing in favorite foods satisfies the condition of, of pizza, then I want to return it. So what's this going to return? This is going to return Matt. Matt has a favorite food that's pizza. Doesn't matter where it is in the array, as long as it's in there, I'll return that one. Yeah. So that is just a quick introduction. There's a lot more to SQL plus plus than that, but that's kind of the basics of how we can take SQL and apply it to non-relational data. Yeah, go ahead. So in that query on the screen right now, mm -hmm. you're satisfied F equals the ones to pizza. Yeah. That's likely not an index field. So are we back to performance problems now that we're checking every document for that uh, equivalence function? Okay, so the question is about indexing. Uh, so you can index that field okay. if you want to, right? Um, if you don't index it, in fact, in Calspace, I'm going to show this in the demo later. If you don't index it, the query will not run. Hmm. Now you could turn on something called a primary index which is equivalent to like a full table scan. You don't want to do that in production because that will have to scan every single piece of data for this query. We'll use basically just indexing the key and nothing else. So it's possible. But actually with analytics engine, it's using something called MPP, massive parallel processing, which kind of reduces the need for indexing. So with analytics, you don't need to worry about those indexes up front. And if there's a problem with a query, it's going to be isolated from your operation data. So it's definitely going to get into this area for sure. But I wanted to, before that demo, I wanted to mention some implementations of SQL++. So I've said Couchbase, and yes, I'm a Couchbase employee, and I think Couchbase is great, but there are other people out there using SQL++ uh, that you should know about. So first is Couchbase, of course. This is probably the most complete production-ready one that you can start using today. Uh, we've got this idea of analytics service is separate from the data service. They're all in the same cluster, but those SQL++ queries are only going to affect these nodes right here. So it's workload isolation. These are the nodes that the app is going to use. These are the nodes that your, your BI visualization dashboard team is going to use. So once a piece of data comes into this part, the operational data, it is queued up to be copied a shadow copy of that data uh, immediately, right? So it's memory to memory. It's uh, as close to real time as, as you, you can get it. It's going to copy that data over there immediately. So you can start including that data in your query responses right, basically right after it changes in the app. It technically is an ETL, so notice that little arrow in there. There's that little devil again. But this is real time. It's created by a couple simple commands. It's all the same cluster. You don't have to set up another ETL process or buy another ETL solution. It's right there in the cluster. So we often call it no ETL, which is what down you got going on down here. Uh, a quick, a couple quick highlights. Uh, we have some visualization of BI connectors like Tableau, for instance. Some data science stuff going on. If you want to use a Python user-defined function to do machine learning, uh, some connection to data lakes. So if you want to connect this data to something in S3 or Azure Data Lake, or Google, you know, Google Cloud, or Parquet, or Azure Blobs, you can connect to those other sources as well and run SQL++ queries on them, joining with the you know, operational data copy that you have here. So lots of good options there. Next one is called Asterix DB. This is one actually came out of that UC San Diego project. This is another Apache uh, project, I think. I'm not 100% sure on that. But this is a big data management system. It's, uh, it does data ingestion. It has some adapters like local file system and HDFS like for Hadoop. Uh, has some like Twitter. Well, it used to be called Twitter. Twitter uh, connectors, RSS, things like that. So it's extensible. 
Basically, Couchbase is using a customized version of this in Couchbase Server. But you can use Asterisk DB, it's more of a low level solution, but you can use that as well. Another one's called Apache Drill. This one, again, no ETL required for this. But I think what it's doing, it's not copying data. So that you're not getting isolation here. It's querying against these data sources directly. So there may be a lot of performance issues there. And of course, uh, you risk uh, impacting the operational data. But uh, they call it in-place analytics. It has a wide variety of connectors. And they use SQL++. So it's worth pointing out. Another one is called Particle. This is an Amazon-backed effort. This was actually something that one of those UC San Diego students went on to Amazon to implement. Uh, DynamoDB is starting to use this. That's uh, AWS's uh, database as a service. And this seems like more of an operational tool, though, not really pure analytics play. So it's using Dynamo. You can't really do all the indexing with Dynamo that you can with other databases. However, it's open source project. It's got a complete implementation. and it's worth mentioning as one of the C++ options. Since so you asked about indexing, um, there is indexing supported um, in all these different tools. I think, I think Drill only supports it for Map R, but otherwise they all support indexing. A lot of time you don't need to worry about it. Like I said, it's uh, um, you know you've got MPP parallelism, you got some metadata examining um, tools that can uh, kind of pick the best execution plan. Uh, but if you want to see the really long and deep answer about how indexing works, there's this link right here, bit.ly slash under the hood. This is one of the professors from UCSD going through the SQL++ implementation. Again, if you're really into a lot of really, you know, hardcore algorithms and stuff like that, this is the session you want to watch. I'm not going to go into that today. Okay, so that's it. Any questions before I switch over to the demo? Yeah. SQL++. Is there a plugin for VS Code for SQL++? So, right. so you, like you have your JSON document, mm -hmm. a little and type SQL query, okay. and boom, it spits it out in another thing. So, it's like the Markdown visualizer. So, you want to run SQL against some JSON files that you have, or I just see this being like insanely helpful yeah. for quick querying against. Yeah, like, yeah. I, no, I, I agree. So there is a there is a VS Code plugin for Couchbase, um, and for IntelliJ and other you know the whole family of of uh, IDEs. But you're going to connect into Couchbase to run those SQL plus plus queries. Of course, then if you have a bunch of JSON files, it's another. I think it's actually in the VS Code uh, it's, um, plugin where you can import into Couchbase and then run your queries against Couchbase data. So. Kind of. You have to use. You have to query Couchbase. So, if you want to query JSON files, I think you might want to look at Apache Drill. It might be a good place to start. Although there's no VS Code plugin for this, as far as I know. Yeah, more, so. it's more just like for, for like yeah. real quick. quick no, I gotcha. I gotcha. That might be a cool addition for the VS Code Couchbase plugin. But yeah, we kind of have people using Couchbase, right? Not right. just JSON files. So <laughs> they might not. They might be resistant to add that feature. So. Yeah. situations like entity framework yeah. for example I do that a lot. Yeah. Uh, is there like any wrapper I guess that would hook into so yes the question is about ORMs and the framework. So as I mentioned the impedance mismatch problem is not really there anymore. Your your data can go directly deserialize and serialize from JSON to your C sharp object. Right. Yeah. However, um, there's other things ORMs can do that uh, you might want might want to use them for. So uh, there is no EF connector for Couchbase, as far as I know, and many, many NoSQL databases don't have one. I think Cosmos DB has one. Um, but there is a library out there if you want to write your queries in link. You can write, there's a link to Couchbase. So okay. you can write your link query, and that will translate it into SQL++ for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> link is very dope, yes. Is there a uh, free or low-class uh, developer's edition for Couchbase? So the question is about, is there a free or developer's edition of Couchbase? So yes, there's a community edition. You can uh, download that and run it in production if you want to for free. That will not have analytics in it. That's only an enterprise edition. Right. But uh, you can run SQL++ queries in it, operational SQL++ queries in it, yes. Oh. Yeah, and there's a, a Docker image you can use. There's also, we have our cloud-based offering uh, called Capella. 
It's a database as a service, so you don't have to manage the infrastructure yourself. Right now, there's a 30-day free trial of that, no credit card. Uh, but keep your eye on Capella because some cool stuff coming up I can't talk about because we are a publicly traded company. <laughs> maybe I'll, if you give me enough drinks later, maybe I'll. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. No, I'm just kidding, Wall Street. No. Uh, Sounds but, like a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> challenge accepted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, any more? Okay. Let's go into a demo here real quick. Uh, I think the easiest way to do this, no, let's leave it there. Okay. So what I've got here is I'm running this in Docker, Couchbase. This is Couchbase Enterprise running in Docker. And again, if you want to experiment with this, not going to production, get the Enterprise Edition, totally free download, no restrictions, other than you can't go into production without a license. So that's what I'm doing today. Uh, just running in Docker. And let's see, where's my screen at? i got too many windows here. Okay, here we go. This is the built-in web UI that ships with Couchbase. So you just go to 8091 or whatever. Right now, I have no data in here. No, they're called buckets, similar to a database in SQL Server or catalog. Nothing in there right now. <clears throat> What's that? No, that's a uh, common confusion. S3 bucket is different than a Couchbase bucket. This was named that was kind of chosen early on, and they're kind of like, eh, it'll be fine. No one will confuse it, but guess what? They do. <laughs> Okay, so uh, what I've also got here is I should have had this open before I started. Is I've got, uh, let's see, you're going to see a little bit behind the scenes here. I'm going to Google Drive. Uh, Reputations 2023. Matt. Intro SQL. Developer Survey. So I've got this uh, Stack Overflow Developer Survey data. It's not big, big data, but for a demo, it's probably fine. So CSV file of data here, and I want to put that in the Couchbase to see what happens. So let's create a bucket here, call it Stack Overflow, SO. I don't need to put a lot of memory for this bucket, so I'll just put the minimum. No replication, I only have the one node anyway, so add that bucket. All right. And what I can do next, so that bucket has zero items, you see, zero items. Nothing going on there. And I'm bringing up, um, wait, let's do it this way. I'm going to bring up Windows Terminal here. Okay, so, oh, it's not the right folder. I was hoping it would give me access into this folder. Uh, let's do this. There's like a right click open terminal. There we go. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's, I, I wanted PowerShell though. Let's try PowerShell. Maybe Power. Oh, that's not it. You say right click open the terminal. Let's see if I have that here. This is Windows 11. I'm still kind of. Open there we go. Terminal. The terminal. Yeah, there you go. Still kind of find my way around. There we go, that's what I want. Okay, got this long folder stru structure here, but I'm going to paste in this command line here. This is called CB import, Couchbase import. This ships with Couchbase server. You can import CSV, import JSON. I'm importing CSV. Connection string is localhost, it's running local. I have these very super secure login credentials right here. The bucket I'm specifying is SO, Stack Overflow. I wanna load this CSV file, not that backup one. Why are you using that? Okay. And don't, don't worry about this dash G. If you're really curious, I can explain it later. So hopefully this will work. It takes a little bit of time to import all those records. Should be about 89,185 lines of CSV. So 89,184 records is what I'm looking for here. You got to set you up with a cool key for your terminal. What's that? You gotta get a cool theme. For cool your theme, yeah. Okay. See, the thing is, I only use this laptop like when I'm traveling. I yeah. use my desktop at home, but I don't have a cool theme with that one either. So. Yeah, I put mine on like GitHub, so I always can pull down my own. Oh my gosh, theme <laughs> right into my computer terminal. Oh posh. Oh my posh. Oh my posh. Yeah. So there is the import eighty nine thousand one hundred eighty four succeeded zero failed. That's good. All right. And go back to this 89,184. All right, so all the data is in there. 
we can actually, if you want to browse it, we can. Also notice that these things called scope and collection, this is kind of like a schema, like DBO is default. This is kind of like table, but it's just default. Not really important today, but here's all the data. So each one of these is a result of Stack Overflow. I want to focus today on remote work. So we're interested in remote work analysis today. Let's do some queries on that. Let's go right here to the query tab. Oh, look at this. Ignore, ignore, delete all. Okay, so I'm going to paste in a SQL++ query here. This is my operational data now. I've not gotten to analytics yet. There is select from Stack Overflow where remote work equals hybrid. Some remote, some in person, kind of like this user group right now. By the way, if you're watching this uh, online or watching this later, one of the benefits of coming to this in person is the amazing smell of popcorn in the room right now. So I highly recommend it. Uh, anyway, so this is going to give me the first 10 that are hybrid, some remote, some in person. Okay, makes sense. Execute, and what's going to happen? Just what we talked about. It's not going to run because there's no indexing in there yet at all. So with relational world, often it'll do a full table scan by default, right? With Couchbase, they decided not to allow this because this could lead to, you know, with large amounts of data, this could lead to very, very unhappy developers, customers, everybody, uh, if you're running these queries that are not indexed at all. So uh, it's going to make you opt into it. Right here it says resource intensive, not recommended in production. But click this button anyway if you want to do it. If you're a developer, it makes sense because you might want to tinker with your queries, you know, figure out the best uh, indexes and so on. But we'll create a primary index just for the sake of getting this query running. And here's the indexes. It's still processing. You can see the index is going there. And uh, I think it says it's ready, but it also says me to, there we go. All right, back to query. Try it again. It executes this time. So the first 10, pretty fast, right? But we're only getting 10, right? So 87 milliseconds, again, not terribly fast, but it's not, not terrible either. Uh, and then this is, was it remote work? Hybrid, some in person. I can also put this in table view. If you if it's relatively flat data, a table view makes more sense sometimes. It's not really a table, but it's just a table view of the data. So there we go. Still, whoop. see, I'm not used to these Windows 11 gestures yet. So sorry about that. So there we go. There is our operational query, and we have to have a well-defined index in order to make that work. Uh, so I could, for instance, create an index. If I know I'm going to be running this one a lot, I could probably run the index advisor. It would tell me what to do. Yeah. So it's saying, hey, here's an index for you that will make your query faster. Yeah. So I could create that. I think I was going to paste that one in anyway, right? Same thing. I execute an index. Uh, it's going to be on remote work. So that means all the remote work fields will be in, in the in the query. This is going to save a lot of time because I am doing s dot star, but uh, Execute this, 5.7 milliseconds, pretty fast. And I can also see that that index is being used here in the query plan. There we go, the one I just created. All right, cool. So that's good, but again, that's kind of a process that doesn't really help if I'm doing ad hoc queries, right? If I'm creating a new dashboard or, or something like that, because I have to then understand and create these indexes ahead of time. And I have to touch the um, operational data. So there's a risk there. So let's go ahead and get rid of these indexes. Deleted those. So now you can see that my query will not work. All right? Okay. So how do I start using analytics? The way I do it is I go to this analytics tab over here. I got a couple things I want to do. So I'm going to create what's called a data set. You can have multiple data sets, and these can have these can be more complicated. They can have predicates and filters and things like that. I just want to create everything. So give me a, a data set that's everything in, in the SO bucket and make a data set called stack. So go ahead and do that. Okay, you see that appears over here. And then once I'm ready, I can say, oh, make that live. Start connecting that to my stack overflow data. So it's going to start advancing the progress over here, I think. Maybe. It may already be done. I'm not sure. 
So whenever I update any data in this SO bucket, it'll automatically get updated in my stack data set. Yep, so that's done. All right, and then let's run that same query here in analytics. Notice I didn't create an index, but it's still able to run. So I can have a more ad hoc interface here to run those queries. I want to drive home the point here with a more complex query. So this one is using Stack Overflow data to get salary information um, based on currency and based on the database they've worked with. So I put Oracle in here. Let's see what the average salary is of someone who works with Oracle, again, according to Stack Overflow self-reported data. So there's, uh, in US dollars, average compensation, 135,000 a year. I can even put this in a chart if I need to. Uh, let's see, let's do a uh, bar chart and we'll do uh, a little currency. Yeah, there we go. So you can kind of see there's the, that's the max. Let's go to average, 135,000. Now that max seems very suspicious to me. Is there a developer out there making 470,000 a year working with Oracle? Yeah, very suspicious. Uh, and all, there's, there's some suspicious data in here. So I tried to filter some of it out by taking some of the extreme examples away, but anyway. So that's Oracle. What did I say it was? 100, no. I wanted to do average. 135,000 a year for Oracle. Let's see what you make if you use Couchbase. Hundred seventy-four thousand a year. So there you go. You want to get a raise? Start working with Couchbase. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. This is all self-reported data. Are the queries so, case sensitive? Are the queries case sensitive? So JSON is case sensitive. So the JSON parts are case sensitive. Yes. Right. So if I said lowercase d, this is going to you know that's on my query, right? No data because there is no field called underscore you know lowercase d database. So yes. Mm -hmm. CSV, right? Yeah. What does the transform happen for JSON? Oh, that CB import does that. The yeah. Okay. So it's 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 reading the CSV row and it's inserting into jobs or into Couchbase. Whenever you insert, it's going to be it's going to end up a JSON data. Transforming your common, yeah. Common format into yeah. JSON. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And you can export to JSON from this as well if you want to load in other systems. You know, CB import, CB export, go either way. Yeah. How does this work with other parties? Uh, installed data systems. Right. So I did show on that slide that there are some connectors to S3 and data lakes, things like that. And we're talking analytics, right? So you can connect to those systems, join them with this data, or just query them on their own. Um, in terms of like copying data from SQL Server or Oracle or whatever, there are lots of tools for that. Lots of. Uh, so it has to be in JSON format before this will touch it. I mean, this will this will only these queries are going to be dependent on your data being in JSON format. You could put other types of data in here, technically. You could put blobs, XML, images, whatever you want in Couchbase, but it's not going to be able to index. You can't index an image or CSV. It has to be JSON. Most of our customers are using JSON data. Some are using you know, the, the, the blob storage, but those are, this is more of a specialized use case. So. OK. So that's that. and. Uh, that's the demo. So anything else you want to see here before I go back and kind of finish up? Anybody in the uh, chat? Got anything to say? Security. How is security mm -hmm. set up? Okay. So security. Um, don't really have anything prepared, but if you go to security here, what you can do is you can add uh, you can have LDAP connection, of course. You can add different groups. Um, adding a user, then you can specify, like, here's the different roles they have, or if you created a group, what group they belong to. So you can have very fine-grained control over, like, oh, I'm only allowed to read data in a certain bucket, for instance. And then if you have scopes and collections, you can specify even further down. Right? Are there grant and revoke and deny statements like in SQL Server? You're talking about, like, the raw syntax? Yeah. Probably. That, I don't know. We can go look it up real quick. So what are they called? Grants? Grants. Uh, it looks like there is. Okay. So, yep, there you go. And yeah. syntax for it. It's all there. 
I assume there's a revoke. Yep, there's a revoke. Okay. And I see transaction support. There's rollback. Yep, yep, full transaction support. That's a relatively uh, newish feature. I mean, this it wasn't around when I first started with Couchbase. It's something we added. So. Okay. Um, what sort of like reflective capabilities does that? Reflective capabilities. Yeah. Interesting. I do that so, all the time. Yeah, it, it helps me you might want to do something like explore your data sort of thing to see what's in there. Yeah, I like to look at like query all ob objects, yeah. query all JSON files, where are they at. Right, yeah, right. I, I write queries on all the time. Right, so right. So, like ad hoc stuff to save myself time. Yeah, right. Well, one of the things that this can do is so the UI here has this explore your data. So it kind of show you the shape of the data. Stack Overflow data is very flat, uninteresting, right? But you kind of see it's found all these fields here. How this, you know, there's no schema you define ahead of time, right? So whatever JSON you put in there is whatever, that's the data. Right? But we can do what's called a sampling of that data. You could take like 10% and see what are the fields that are most common in, in those. And you can kind of show like an inferred schema here. Right, uh, and that's actually a statement you could do. Uh, syntax you could do an infer on that. If you want, that's that's what's feeding this over here is an infer statement. Gotcha. And of course, you, like, select like the system info type. Yes, um, yeah. Uh, again, I forget what they're called, but what are, system colon something? Oh gosh, it's like a slow query queue or a slow query table. What do they call that? So, it'd be like, yeah, it's the stuff that you can get access to, like, yeah, all system, system, queries against it. Like system that. key space is what they call it, yes. Oh. So, there are some of these. Um, let's see if they're listed here. Uh, wait, that's not right. That's the roles again. All right, we'll go back here. What What's happening? Go away. All right. Uh, that's, this is way too low level. Why am I going here? Um, well, I can't find it in the docs <laughs> for whatever reason, but yes, there is system key spaces that can show you queries that are running, you know, the slowest queries. Um, it can give you metadata about the collections and scopes, things like that. Yeah. I assume, yeah, because you can you show that one thing where you can add data out for what the keyword was. Yeah, that was unnest. Unnest. Mm -hmm. So you can unnest, and you also loop, like, can you write looping structures and stuff? Looping. So, um, yeah, a cursor. Yeah. So, um, so there isn't, there's not really store procedures in this. There's something called a UDF, um, user defined function. I don't know if there's looping in there. I don't think it'd be called cursor, but we could, we could check. Yeah, that's low level stuff. So, um, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. There might be, but um, you can use CTEs, common table expressions, if you want to kind of self reference yeah, that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that your example has CTE in it? Yeah. But uh, so, how do the UDFs, so the function, differ from a store procedure that I might be used to in SQL Server? Uh, I mean, there are UDFs in SQL Server as well, right? So, it's right. kind of the same thing. Um, but they're, they're distinct from a store procedure. Right, that's UDF correct. Is a per row result versus a store procedure is essentially coding SQL right. into a routine. Yes, so that's that's more what a UDF would be. Okay. Uh, I can't find a good so Python UDF. Parallel SQL UDF. Yes, yes, very much so. So there is another feature. Again, uh, this is kind of not really related to analytics, but that's fine, called eventing, um, eventing service. This is also a um, enterprise edition feature, but this is where you can write uh, JavaScript code and combine it with SQL++ code in, inside. Uh, that will um, these functions will be called in response to different mutation events, so creation, deletion um, of data will call some code that you've written, custom code. So people schedule. Um, schedule there are timers. I think you can run a timer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, people see, put these in common with triggers. They say it's like a trigger, but it's not like a, it's not a trigger because it's not it's asynchronous. So it's not going to lock anything. It's going to just run that code based on a change that happened. But that's mm -hmm. similar to that sort of thing. Okay, so I just broadcast the event and fire it 
off. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, pub sub probably. Yeah. It's kind of kind of an internal pub sub sort of thing, right? Um, if you want to do like an external pub sub, Kafka would be the way to go. Yeah. There's a couch based consumer and producer for Kafka. Uh, if documents aren't going to be uh, locked during any of this, um, how do you prevent race conditions? Right. So you can uh, use a transaction if you want to. If there's a it says, you can. Yeah, so you can use transaction. You can also use you can also use locking, right? So you can specify optimistic and pessimistic locking at a single document level. Yeah, absolutely. At a single document level. Right. So I can say lock this document. I'm gonna make a change to it. No, don't let anybody else lock it. Uh, or anybody else but modify you can't it. Lock a query to make sure that nothing's changing in the data while you're running the query. So you can put that in a transaction. So you would the do. transaction would do that for you. Uh, I believe so, yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, with this tr distributed architecture, right now you're dealing with multiple machines over a network, right? So, mm -hmm. a transaction is always overhead, but now you put the network in there, and it's even more overhead. So, if you can try to keep transactions to a minimum, right? Um, but they are there when you need them. Okay. These are good, great questions, y'all. I'm loving it. Any more before I go back to the slides? I didn't see anything on. Oh, here's a question online. Will it suit time series data like like perform aggregates? So, I love this question because well, actually, let's see. Let's give me another question. Because we just introduced time series functionality to Couchbase. This is in the latest version seven. No, this isn't the right post. That's 2020. Uh, time series. I'll just go to the docs, I guess. Time series, so it's still JSON data, right? But if you format it in a certain way, TS start, TS end, TS interval, TS data, Let's see if I can get an example here. So here's a time series data of a stock ticker. Mm -hmm. If data is formatted like this, then what you get is all well, time series data, um, but you also get, if I get down here, where is it? Querying. So there is a time series function that's part of SQL++ now. So if you want to query that time series data, as long as it's formatted in a certain way, you can use this to treat that data as if it were time series. So I'm not saying Couchbase is a time series database, because it's not, but it does have time series capabilities now. You, have, you said another question you thought of? Uh, maybe I'll hold off on it. No, it's, okay. I don't know if it fits this particular system at all, but vector database. Oh, yes, vector databases. Figured I'd bring it up. I yeah. don't know if this would be the, the right tool for that. I can't say anything while Wall Street's watching. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All righty. Uh, yeah, vector is all the new hotness these days, right, with the AI and LLMs and whatnot. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. The answer is no. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They say you only remember three things from any given presentation. So before you leave, I want to give you those three things. So first one is no SQL does not mean no SQL. Like SQL is not allowed anymore. What it really means is SQL plus plus. Now we need SQL plus plus for that data. SQL plus plus is JSON with superpowers. So it's backwards compatible. You already know it, but it's got extra stuff. You know, you can modify JSON data. And if you're using SQL plus plus for analytics, you can minimize your time spent on writing and maintaining and patching ETLs. Remember the log4j situation? How many millions of systems need to patched for that? Uh, and you can maximize your SQL skills. So those are the three things. Uh, reduce those little arrows is what I'm saying. Those are the three things I think you should take away from this session. If you want to learn more about some uh, the stuff I referenced today, so research paper links, uh, some really dry reading, but important historical stuff. You should definitely check it out. The UC SD Research, they've kind of removed their major website for this project because it's an older project, right? And the students have all graduated, and I'm sure the funding has dried up, things like that. But it's a it's not really a research project anymore. It's actually in you know commercially available products and open source products. But if you want to read the paper, you can go check it out there on um, ARXIV. And that's uh, I think Cornell publishes that one. Don Chamberlain, uh, here's that link I promised you for the free PDF of the book. If you want to get that, Couchbase made that available. It's also on Amazon if you want to check that out. He's also been in some videos. Um, 
talking about NoSQL and SQL++ and a, and a tech panel on query language evolution. Great stuff. He's a really, really intelligent guy. And uh, um, I'm super glad that he's uh, hooked up with Couchbase to give us some uh, technical advice. If you want to learn more about Couchbase, there's a bunch of links for you. Free playground, totally free in browser. No need to install anything. Just get started working with Couchbase. Uh, you can get Capella going there, uh, or you can install the regular you know, download and install on your machine. Free training, upcoming events. These are analytics-specific blogs, but of course we've got lots of blogs. Analytics-specific forums, but we've got a lot of other forums. And the new thing we have is Discord. I think we just passed a thousand people in our Discord. Uh, so if you want to go in there and discuss Couchbase, NoSQL, SQL databases, lots of our engineers are there, lots of our customers are there. Great place to talk about that. Um, if you're in Discord. So that's it. Um, I'm super honored that you guys had me back to do your very first in-person session in a number of years. So thank you very much for that. That's just truly an honor, and I'm glad to be here. For everyone else watching this later or watching online, come down next time. Check it out. Of course, the next session, I think, is, is virtual, though, right? But, yeah, they will have another in-person session soon. So definitely check Meetup. it out. Meetup.com slash Glugnet, G-O-U-G-N-E-T. Keep an eye on that. We will certainly update that with where our locations are. and where our... We are booked out through the end of the year. This is the first time we've ever done that. We're booked a whole year at once. Um, and um, I hope that continues. And uh, that's an older picture of me. I look better than so. <laughs> Can we zoom in on that? Yeah. <laughs> and it's good for you to see as well. Yeah. It's yeah. getting bigger. There we go. Yeah, yeah, it looked better then. There we go. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to keep it going. We're, we're excited. We obviously have a lot of people who are – what we're seeing is is that there's uh, – people have kind of come out from the pandemic, and there's a big push for speakers. I know I've, in every – Conference I've gone to, particularly in the, I've gone to a couple so far that are in person this year, SQL conferences, uh, SQL Saturday, things like that. They were overwhelmed with submissions. People are anxious to get back into in person and and speak to a group and get the feedback of the group, get the vibe of the group. Uh, and we are as, as anxious as anyone else to do that again, but we need to have a viable venue. Uh, so uh, go out, go out to meetup.com, uh, sign up. Uh, send us a message if you have a venue in the Lansing area that you'd love to share with us, even if it's only for a couple months. We'd love to do it. Yeah, and this is a great venue we're here, by the way. I don't know if you'll be here in the future, but it's uh, Lansing Makerspace. Is that what it's called? Or? Lansing Makers Network, I think. It's a fantastic facility. Lots of tools and lots of cool, nerdy stuff down here. Definitely come down and get a tour sometime. Check it out. Very nerdy. You'll <laughs> love it. Yeah. I, I do love it. I'm going to stay the night here. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that uh, wraps it up um, for our online portion. Thank you very much, Sam, for helping coordinate this as well. My pleasure. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Okay. Right. Darren, thank you. Bye, everybody.